John 13. Okay, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Okay, the them in this context is the apostles. So there's a springtime happening this time of year. Uh, It says, And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So he's one of the apostles. He was a... Uh, Walking, talking devil, but he looked like a man. That's a different idea, but that's what Jesus Christ said. Uh, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, uh, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, uh, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And Simon Peter saith unto him, uh, Lord, uh, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not to save that wash his feet, or to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. <clears throat> For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. Okay, the ye are not all clean is referring to Judas Iscariot. So after he had washed their feet and taken his garments, uh, and sat down again, he saith unto them, He said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? You guys know what I did? And of course, the answer is usually no. Uh, he says, You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, so ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this, The servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. Okay, let's go and pray. Lord, I pray you'd help us understand this idea. Help us recognize that uh, this book, this owner's manual, will show us uh, what true happiness is about. And, of course, the greatest news anybody can know is for certain that they're going to heaven when they die. Faith in Jesus Christ, that's the greatest news. And I pray you'd help us see what Jesus Christ is saying here know how to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, that word happy there, verse 17, is the only recorded time Jesus said happy as far as the Bible goes. Okay, I'm not saying he didn't say it another time, but the Bible only recorded it one time. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and this is the only occurrence of the word happy in the conversation of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a, an example of foot washing. Now, a few churches do promote the idea of foot washing. They do believe that it's one of the ordinances. Usually, if you go, uh, let's see, if you go east of here over in Warsaw area, Winona Lake, there's Grace Brethren. That's uh, Grace College. I attended there for a couple of years. They do foot washing. Okay, they think it's one of the three, the three ordinances of a church where they have baptism, communion, or Lord's Supper, and foot washing. Uh, it looks like to me that an ordinance for a church was introduced in the Gospels, practiced in Acts, and explained by Paul. So foot washing doesn't seem to match the three criteria, but I don't care. doesn't matter. If they want to practice foot washing, fine and dandy. And if we don't want to, fine and dandy. Okay, uh, if you want to get close to it, go to a reflexologist, I suppose. You know. But either way, okay, now this idea for happy... Okay, that, that is a natural and normal desire for anybody. Okay, who, what kid is born and he gets up to age and starts figuring things out in life? He says, I want to be miserable the rest of my life. Uh, no, he wants to be happy. Okay, and this was the only time Jesus Christ used the word as it's recorded in the Bible. Now, the devil and the world, the world advertisement, the spirit of the world... They will use the natural desire of everyone to be happy as a carrot on a stick. And you're always chasing that carrot, but you never get 
the happiness. Hollywood is trying to portray this is what makes you happy. But when you look at these people's lives, they're miserable people. Okay, they're on dope, they're drunk, they're going from this divorce to another. You don't know if they're male or female. They don't know if they're male or female. They break down. They don't know what it is. And you look in their eyes, and I said this about Robin Williams about three months before he died. I said, you look in that man's eyes, and he is a miserable individual. And he dies a few months later. Okay, Hollywood doesn't know what happiness is about. Okay, what they do is they put this carrot on this stick... Okay, and they keep that out in front of a young, on, on a young person, and at first it'll have some pleasure. Hebrews 11 says the pleasures of sin for a season. So at first they say, yeah, that's exciting, yeah, it's a new thing. And so they start chasing after this carrot on this stick, and then they start realizing, hey, that's, something's not going on. And life starts getting frustrating, okay, and discontentment, but they keep chasing the carrot on the stick. And then eventually, until the carrot is hung over a canyon, and they chase for the carrot, and they end up and die. By then, it's too late. I mean, they're not going to tell them in that process. That's what the world does. That's what the, uh, the devil does in company. They dangle this natural, normal desire for happiness out there with a false premise. Now, the natural desire for happiness, the fairy tales always end their stories and they lived happily ever after. Okay, in our country, in the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. It's a natural desire. Down at the bar, they'll say happy hour. Yeah, it'll be happy at that time until they get home. And then the next morning, a hangover is designed to occupy the mind that was unoccupied the night before. Okay, a happy hunting ground. That's probably legit, a happy hunting ground. Okay, but uh, people say he's happy-go-lucky. Okay, now happy-go-lucky, that idea reveals that happiness is really a state of mind, irregardless or regardless of the circumstances. Okay, I've been, uh, first year, first uh, overseas trip I took was Romania, a church of about 80 people. Four cars in the entire church, but I noticed they had happiness that American Christians did not have. Down in Panama, where my son attends church, again, it's a church of about the same size, about four cars. And again, I noticed those people, a lot of them are happy. Happiness is, is a state of mind. It does not depend on the circumstances of life. It depends upon the condition of a person's heart. And the focus in their mind. Pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. I like this statement. Happy is the man that has a friend. But happier is the man who is a friend. And happiest is the man who has a friend and is a friend. And that's one thing I pray for missionaries more than anything, is that God would give them a friend, a good friend of that culture. Because that's what they need more than anything. So I'm going to give you some thoughts about happiness this morning. The first thought is about the science aspect. So we'll look at the science aspect. And I know that uh, the, the world agenda, they think that science and the Bible contradict, but that's not true. Scientism and the Bible contradict. That's a religion. Not Scientology, scientism. That's the established religion of the public school system and the state colleges. Science. The science of the idea of happiness is usually going to refer to a hormone or chemical in your body called serotonin. Okay, and that's kind of, it's known to be your, the happy chemical, or it gives you a mood uh, stabilizer, serotonin. And uh, it's, it's, it is a scientific uh, thing that our body does produce these things in certain situations. And the thing is, we got to recognize that God will have a system like to produce serotonin in a right way, and then the devil is going to twist it just slightly in the wrong way. Okay, and it's always, it's always a pattern that he does, and I'll explain that a little bit further. But serotonin impacts every part of your body, and it's, it works through your emotions to your motor skills. It is a natural mood stabilizer. It's a chemical in your body that helps with sleeping, eating, and digestion, and it helps reduce depression... 
regulate anxiety, heal wounds, and maintains bone health. It is a natural mood stabilizer. Okay, when st- serotonin levels are normal in the body, the person tends to be happier, more calm, more focused, less anxious, and more emotional stable. Okay, I think millennials don't have any of that serotonin in their body. Okay, but even at that. Okay, now here's the trick on it. The world agenda, okay, the advertising industries, the international corporations know how to take a false ser- or a serotonin, your body produces serotonin, but yet it gives you a temporary happiness. And you've got to keep coming back until you get hooked on it. Okay, that's the method. That's what's done. Uh, like uh, you can't stop eating them. The reason why you can't stop eating them is that there's a chemical put in the chip, potato chip, that triggers your appetite where you want to continue to eat it. Yeah, it's in the chemicals. People say, that's conspiracy. You ain't a kid it is. You get in the food industry and you're talking about some strange stuff. Okay, with pumping in estrogen, pumping in testosterone. People at the high powers of B have already advertised down in Georgia at the Georgia Guidestones that they want to get world population down to 500 million. And that's one good way to do it. Okay, and it's through the food industry. But even at that, the devil knows how to take a natural thing, serotonin, and get uh, and allow it to be produced in our body on a short-term basis, but give us a temporary high, as they say. Okay, and so here's some of the methods. Obviously, chemicals and drugs. Now, when I say drugs, I'm saying legal and illegal. Some of the biggest pusher of drugs wear white coats and have MD on the door, and it's called mad doctor or medical, you know, whatever. Yeah, that stuff is mind-altering drugs. And that's what's never discussed, never discussed since Columbine is the mind-altering drugs that people are taking. We'll not discuss that. That's taboo. Okay, but that's one way of serotonin. It can be produced on a temporary basis. Another way is music. I've been looking at this idea of music on a megahertz uh, level at 440 or 432. 432 seems to be the... A right approach where 440 just twitches a little bit where it just really messes up the body. Uh, and, and it don't take much. Okay, the internet, social media. <laughs> There's a serotonin that's produced. That's a temporary serotonin, but it causes an addiction to this. It's an amazing thing how that does it. Uh, entertainment, <clears throat> sports, okay, the media outlets, they know what to do to cause our serotonin levels to rise, but it's just a temporary thing. It gives us a temporary pleasure, and we have to keep coming back to it. Okay, there are natural ways of boosting serotonin in your body. One is sunlight. Just get out in the sun. Okay, now I recognize, you know, uh, sometimes people can get out in the sun too much, but there is a healing technique so called light therapy, and what it's doing is it's, it's increasing the serotonin levels. Regular exercise can help with mood-boosting effects. I am a basketball nut. I like basketball, but I like the sweating aspect. Okay, I like that part. Uh, there's some fellows at Rensselaer. We have noon ball. We used to play at St. Joe on a college court. And if we only had four guys, we still play full court because we want to run and sweat. But the idea of sweating, in Genesis chapter 3, the Lord said that we got to work by the sweat of our brow. There's something about sweating that just keeps the plumbing moving. And a good sweat will help settle the moods of people. Healthy diet. Healthy diet. Okay, real food. You know, when you leave the produce section of the store, you're going in the non, non-food non section. <laughs> but even at that. Okay, but a healthy diet. Eggs, cheese, turkey, uh, nuts, salmon, pineapple are some methods. Okay, another thing that's a natural serotonin producer is meditation. Now, when I say meditation, I'm not talking TM or Buddhist. 
Okay, the devil will take something true, slightly twist it, okay, and then mess a person up. Meditation, the Bible form of meditation is active, thinking, over and over. Now, I know us men, we have in us what's called a nothing box, and we can get in that nothing box and just stay in it for quite a while, just as long as we have a good one thought in that nothing box, and we're thinking. A passive meditation where you clear your mind. Years ago, I was in karate for a little bit, and they said, sit there and meditate. Well, what happened is the, the sensei had to pay, he had somebody to come in and pay a big bill, so he just told us to sit there and meditate while he's collecting the money. But he said, clear your mind. I'm trying to think, clear my mind. I can't do that. <laughs> but a passive meditation empties the mind, and any spirit can give thoughts. Okay, and there's, there's quite a bit to this. A uh, farmer I knew years ago, uh, met him uh, through my brother, uh, this farmer, uh, uh, pretty intelligent fella, pretty smart guy, and he would usually go to meetings and play dumb and then ask questions to find out if the guy knew what he's talking about. It's a pretty good technique. Well, he and I struck up a friendship, and uh, he had a Bible study with several farmers and guys that worked with farms, farmers, just six guys, and they had it early on a Friday morning, and he asked me to come to it. Uh, it was a church that believed in a faith and work system, okay, a church with morality, but they believed in a faith and work system. So the first time I taught in the, class, in the thing, they gave me two chapters, and each guy would take two chapters, and you just keep rotating every six weeks. So after I got done, they, I don't know, it must have impressed them. They learned some things. They were really surprised. And uh, they asked me what, how I got interested in the Lord, and that's how they put it. And I said, well, I was raised Dutch Reformed. And they said, what's that? I said, faith and work system. And then they go, well, don't we all believe that? I said, not me. <laughs> faith in Jesus Christ only. Oh, well, the farmer that invited me loved it because he was saved. He and I talked on several occasions. And he started bringing his siblings, his brothers to me, and I would witness to them. So he would listen to me, witness to these people. And so that was in April. I was part of that Bible study. Come December, he had met, their church had had a young kid that was demonized, about 23-year-old kid. He was really possessed. He, he, had, he was infested. But they didn't know what to do with him, so they'd put him in a mental ward, and then he'd get him out and back in, back in, in and out. And so he wanted to help the young fellow. He wanted me to talk to him. So uh, he's in the grain bin. They were shelling some corn. I think they had some popcorn. I think they were shelling some popcorn. And so I'm sitting in the car with this kid, and I'm talking to the kid, and I can see, boy, his eyes are popping. And you look at people's eyes, you can see what's going on. And the kid looked at me, and he tried staring me down, and I put my hands in front of his eyes and said, don't do that to me. And he did that three times. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to almost sort of kind of hypnotize you. And I told my friend, after meeting with this kid, talking to this kid for a half hour, an hour, I said to my friend, I said, um, you better leave that kid alone. He said, well, I want to help him. I said, that's commendable, but you don't know what you're doing. At the same time, he was studying this health method where you can take water and put it in, a, in a, like a little pool or a cubicle and uh, put Epsom salt in, and then you float in the water, and then you meditate. And he told me about that, and I would read a little bit about that. I said, okay, I can see the benefit. I said, but what? I said, what meditation are you doing? What are you doing? He said, I'm clearing my mind. I said, don't do that. Please, don't do that. He said, why is that? I said, that's a counterfeit of the Bible. The Bible wants us to think. Meditate over and over and over. Meditate. Well, he said, you need to keep an open mind. I said, my mind is open until it, change, when, until it goes contrary to the book. Okay, at the same time he's getting that, same time he's dealing with this young man, and I, and I told him, I said, please, you don't know what you're doing. And uh, so that was December. January, Jan and I, we, our family took a two-week trip someplace, I forget where. I think it was down south. And I came back, and I, it was on a Saturday, and we stopped at his house because he was going to buy me a couple guns. Uh, he was going to give me a couple guns. <laughs> and, uh, and so I stopped at his house. He's running out of the house. I said, hey, I'd like to get them guns. He said, I am busy. He said, I'm going to a restaurant. Come back. See me Monday. I said, okay. And so it was no more than 15 seconds by me. Uh, Saturday night, he's in his cubicle, meditating, has his second vision, 
scares him to death, goes out to his barn, and shoots himself. Of course, that's a shocker. Uh, 40 year old. And so I got to talk to his brothers and I said, What happened? said, he got acting like that young man, just like him. I said, yeah, I see how that happened. Spirits of this kid, passive mind, goes right on this kid. You see, spirits in the Bible are depicted as birds, small winged things, the Holy Ghost, the, the dove, unclean spirits or flies, mosquitoes. And so if a guy's got 100 flies buzzing in his head and you're around him, okay, there, a couple of flies might come your way. And I talked to his brother, and I said, what happened here in this situation? And he said, he started calling every man in the church, was asking them about their salvation. He'd call them at 2 in the morning, 4 in the morning, and he would ask them exactly what I would ask his brothers and the people he brought to me. And he said he had two visions in that, in that meditation, and the second one, that scared him, and he took his life. Okay? And that's why I'm saying meditation Biblically, you have to actively think. When a person clears their mind, the idle mind or the idle mind is a devil's workshop. Yes, he can put thoughts in our minds. As the world put I mean, just think what's floating through the air right now. All these television, all the cell phone conversation, all this is going through the air. And once in a while, that will percolate in. So the idea is that we need to have the Bible source of these things. Okay, so biblically, uh, Genesis 30, verse uh, 13. First time the word happy is found in the Bible. These will be some biblical sources uh, for serotonin or happiness. Again, happiness is really more so a condition of the heart. But Genesis 30, verse 13, it says, And Leah said, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. And she called his name Asher. So it's a new child. Hopefully the family, the home, is the best source of happiness. But we're living in a day and age where the family is under attack, and it's so much under attack, they don't even know that a male and female should be the top part of the family. I mean, they're debating that idea. Okay, and that's, that's the, the family, the home should be a place of solitude and happiness. But I'm sorry, it, it, the vast majority aren't that way anymore. And that's why the mess is that's going on in this world. And the idea when God gives a young couple, hopefully not coming from, you know, some factory someplace, uh, you know, but... Where you got the natural thing, man and wife, husband and wife, they have a child. Okay, now they got to think outside themselves. See, that's what a baby does. A person has to think outside themselves and be concerned of another living creature, living being. Empty, clean slate. What am I going to do with this clean, innocent Okay, and the thing is, we got to step outside ourselves. And that's what Jesus Christ was telling in John 13. Is the example, he was saying, you're washing the feet of somebody else. I'm stepping outside of myself, helping somebody else. Depressed people think of themselves. That's all they're doing. And if they get outside themselves, they'll find out there are a lot of people who got a lot of worse times than they do. It's all over the place. And... Consider the plight of the poor is another thing. This is part of this, thinking outside ourselves. Proverbs 14, verse 21. Okay, where this one says, He that despises his neighbor sinneth, but he that hath mercy on the poor, happy is he. Okay, now again, uh, the idea, that doesn't mean that you go find a panhandler and going to pay him some. You know there's a school in Chicago for panhandling? Learn how to be a panhandler. Okay, and uh, Neil Trahan was down in Pensacola, Florida, street preaching on one side, and a guy was panhandling the other side, a Vietnam vet, at least that's what he said, and wanting some money, and Neil's sitting there preaching away, and then he happens to notice the guy, and the guy goes like this, and he, saw, he noticed a phone, and then all of a sudden, here comes a black limo, a limousine, Parks right there. He takes his wheelchair up, folds it up, puts it in a trunk, gets in and drives off. 
panhandling. And I think in this context, we'll see the word neighbor. And that's the thing. The idea is if you know somebody, that's the ones that are going through a tough time. That's the ones you want to help. You're not helping these, these fake beggars on the streets. You're not helping them. And a person, sometimes you feel hard. A lot of times the church will have beggars come in and they'll usually reek of cigarettes. And I'm, I'm, my, my thought is, that, well, if you quit buying this, maybe you can have a little money here. But uh, I don't give church money away. I don't have the authority to do that. If I want to do it myself, I might. But in this day and age, people are professional beggars. Okay? And, and some of them feel like they're entitled to it. Okay, if you're on a street and you see somebody's wanting, you know, I ask them for, you know, in high school, when I was in high school, they, there was a saying, you got a spare change I can have? I'd say yes and no. They said, what's that? I said, I got a spare change, but you can't have it. <laughs> But uh, the thing is, is if a guy on the street's asking for money and you do want to help him, walk him down, walk him down to a restaurant and tell, I'll buy you food. Most of them will turn you down because they want the money for something else. But happy is the man that considereth the poor. Somebody's worse off than you and I. We ought to take some time and try to help them out. Okay, in second, in first Kings chapter 10 verse 8, there's a queen named she, Queen of Sheba, called Queen of Sheba. And she'd heard about Solomon. Solomon was the richest and the wisest and all this stuff. And he had a bunch of workers. And he says, happy are thy servants. So, this idea is, uh, if you got a job that you enjoy, you can have some happiness or serotonin from the job where you look forward to working on the job. Now, maybe it's a bum job. Maybe you got some bum people you're working with. But still, the idea, happiness is a condition of the heart, and that job can become a ministry. And you can be a good testimony to others. Okay, and so one can learn to appreciate his work. One can learn to enjoy his work. Now, Paul said in Philippians 4.11, he said, that I have learned in whatsoever state I am with, therewith to be content. Now, when he wrote that, he was in a Roman jail. He said, I could be content. Now, he was a single man, so he didn't have to worry about family or anything, per se. And that's one of the biggest things that gets guys in jail is thinking about the family on the outside. <clears throat> but still at that, Paul said, I can be content. And then he said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to 8, he says, if you have food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Now, if I was a Greek friar, I would change that verse. He definitely got to have a problem <laughs> for Americans. If I got food and raiment, then I can be content. Okay, but if you got a type of job, maybe you know one of a few that self-employed, that's good. You work for your own boss. Okay, that that's a, a a desire to build things, create things. Okay, I can remember growing up, we'd be doing something on the farm, and we'd get to the end of the day, and we'd be at a at a stopping off plate. Man, I can't figure it out. We just oh, forget it. Dad say, forget it. Let's go home. So we walk over to the home. And, and next morning, Dad gets up and says, I know what we're going to do. And I'm thinking, how did, he, how did he come up with that idea? He slept on it. A lot of times you sleep on things, you come up with a plan. And when I was building that log house down there, I'd get to a point where I, you know, so I'd go home go to bed. And I'd come back, oh, yeah. And I thought, oh, I remember my dad doing that. <laughs> it works. Okay, and so the thing is, is we can enjoy our work. Okay, learn to enjoy your work. In Psalm 144, verse 15, it says, Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Okay, if you travel the world, <clears throat> go to uh, a Muslim culture. See people walk around with a smile on their face. And they'll say, have a good day. No, they won't. They don't say that to you. Why? Happy is the people whose God is the Lord. Where are they wanting to go? They're wanting to go to a society that has a Christian basis. Okay? That's where they want to go. Happy is the people whose God is the Lord. Why? The, the Lord is in His presence, His pleasures forevermore. You get joy and happiness just spending time with the Lord. God provides hope to people. If you would look in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13. 
Another source of happiness, and this might be surprising a lot of folks, or boosting your serotonin, is read the Bible. You know, I, I, Jen and I have been in studying health for a long time, physical health. We've done all sorts of stuff. We've tried anything and everything you can think of. I mean, uh, you go to the average health food store, it looks like she flew in on a broom, but it doesn't matter. Okay, but you know the greatest source of physical health, mental health, and of course spiritual health is, is right there. In Proverbs 3, in verse 8, it says, it, that, referring to this, it shall be health to thy navel. There is a healing technique or at least a diagnose technique where you take a supplement and put it on the navel and do a little muscle testing. You can tell if the body needs it or doesn't need it from the navel. Why? That's our original source. Okay, so he says in verse 13, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things thou canst desire not to be compared unto her. Length of days, look at that, length of days is in her right hand and her left hand riches and honor. Now I understand, I understand doctrine there, Old Testament doctrine, but still in verse 6, length of days. Reading a Bible helps increase your physical life. Why? Because there's life in here. And when you spend time in life, the life comes off the page. And it's a, ha- it's a happy thing to know that if you don't know an answer, at least you have a source to go to. Right there in that book. In Proverbs 28, verse 14, it says, it refers to a man that's happy when he fears the Lord. And then Job said, Job chapter 5, verse 17. Here's what he said. Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. Okay, happy is the man that God correcteth. Sometimes young people have an intention to do something, obviously, maybe something wrong. They want to have their way. They want to satisfy something. And they don't want mom and dad to know. And then they get caught. Man, why not always get caught? You ought to be glad to get caught. You know, all God has to do to any of us is just leave us alone. That's all he's got to do. If he just left me alone and would not interfere in some things that my flesh wants to do, if he just left me wrong, wrong, alone, I can make a royal mess of it. Thank God for his correction. <clears throat> Okay, you're looking at a, at a fella <clears throat> that went through high school, never went to, uh, you know, never went to a party, never went to, you know, um, never drank or anything, no drug, nothing like that. And it's not credit to me; it's credit to my parents. And I, I heard the kids at school, and I, you know, why don't you go to these things? Oh, I got to work. Got to get in a tractor. <laughs> thank God for that. Okay, thank God for His corrections. Appreciate the Lord for that, because if the Lord just left us alone, wow, could I make a mess of it. So fear God, and it gives you some happiness, and appreciate His corrections. And the last one, if you would, 1 Peter chapter 3, and this is where it gets tough. 1 Peter chapter 3. Okay, this is stepping in, up into the, uh, if you want to call it elite Christianity, I don't know. Does anybody get there? I don't know. Paul did. Yeah, he was an unusual character. But here's what Peter said. In 1 Peter 3.14, he said this, But and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. Now, make sure you're suffering for the right reason. If you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. Now, he said that once. Okay, once we could take it. But look in chapter 4, verse 14. He up and said it again. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Now, a good place to practice on that is on the street. Get on the street, hold a Bible verse sign, and watch the reaction. And watch what they say to you. And when they say some pretty crude things, happy are ye. In Acts chapter 5, the apostles suffered some pretty bad things, and it says that they rejoiced in that they were counted worthy to suffer for his sake. That steps into a little different realm, but it's, it's no different than a football running back getting into the touch to, in, in, a, in an end zone. 
But how did he get the end zone? Everybody got out of his way and was very nice and polite to him. Can you imagine the running back coming to the coach? Those guys are mean out there. Hey, you get on the street, that's where the front lines are at. Okay, and that's a good place to practice. And you learn to smile when they say, F and Jesus. When I first started hearing that down in Peru, I said, whoa, that's pretty heavy. And then they say what they say, and you just say, do it for the Lord's sake. You're fighting, you're dealing with spirits. And those spirits don't like the Spirit of God. They don't like Jesus Christ. And they let it be known. When a kid has got a lot of spirits in him, drunken, he's been drinking the spirits. When he gets a lot, the spirits come out. And boy, do they say vulgar stuff. And First Peter says, happy are ye if you suffer for righteousness' sake. So those are more biblical sources for happiness. But I tell you, you know... This book, B-I-B-L-E, means uh, be informed before leaving earth or basic instruction before leaving earth. I mean, happiness is found in this book, but like Jesus Christ said, happy are ye if you do them. Knowing it's one thing, doing it's a different thing. Okay, we'll pray there. Lord, I do pray and ask that by chance if somebody who's not saved, not born again, that they'd see their need of Christ. And also I pray that you'd help us realize that happiness technically, truly, is a is a condition of the heart and help us to rejoice and have trust in thee, faith in thee, so that we might be a blessing to others and to try to be a blessing to their lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Sam, would you come up and lead a song? We have a baptism, a couple baptisms. So